The 311 Response Center is the main gateway to city services. As small as our population is, we do take a lot of requests. Um, most cities that have 311 systems, you'll find that more of their calls are question related and don't end up in service requests. Pittsburgh, I believe, is the complete opposite. The majority of our calls are going to end with a service request. Sometimes we'll get one call that will generate 25, 30 different requests. I, I really believe that 311 is a, a great factor, probably in all cities, because if we didn't have it, then the, the public would probably have a harder time trying to contact these offices just on a personal level because there's so much. So we do what we can to try to help in between because sometimes it doesn't always have to go directly to whatever that department is because if we can help, if we have whatever forms that need to be sent out, then that's one less step that someone has to, you know, one less day that they have to wait for the mail to get, get their items and things like that. So I guess at the end of the day, as long as um, they're satisfied, then we've done our job. Citizens can contact us a variety of ways. We have live operators. We've expanded our hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is exciting. Different hours, odd hours, feel free to call us and leave a message at 311. It answers 24 hours a day. And then uh, we also have 311 postcards that will pass out at community meetings that you can fill out and send in. Those are postage paid. So if you have a group event and need some of those, please feel free to let us know. We also have a Twitter account, and our handle for that is at PGH311. And we can actually process service requests through that handle and send back your service request ID number. Through the years we've been growing and building and uh, we're up to 11 staff now and one of our most exciting endeavors at this point is we're finally getting new software. Uh, we're currently using uh, something that was built in-house in the late 1980s and now we're moving up to a new product. We're in the process of implementing it and hope to have full implementation by this summer or fall. So. That's going to make a lot of great improvements to 311, um, the efficiency of the service we can provide, so we're very excited about that. Twitter has opened up an opportunity for an entire new process to people who don't normally have an opportunity to reach out to 311. It's fast, it's monitored 24-7, generally replying to people between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. It, it can be challenging at times to respond um, to a certain person's needs with only 140 characters, but there's a, there's a few times where we have to send multiple tweets. We're making our website more self-service, so people will be able to go in and find the answers to, to questions they need without having to contact us. It makes it a lot more convenient. Uh, we'll be building the knowledge base that, that goes along with that. Um, for years, updating and putting more information in so that we can try to address everyone's needs. This is the type of job where you have to have an open mind, have to have compassion, and you have to listen, <laughs> you know, because you can, you can easily not understand what someone says and then it just doesn't end, up, end well. So um, we try to make sure that each person and their concerns we have to we make them aware that we are very serious about what it is that they're bringing to us and that we want to help them and we want to give them that feeling of it's not so much like a machine you know i'm a, I'm a real person when i answer the phone and and let me do what i can to help to assist you Next up, we have Ronnie Sue Johnson. She's here from all the way from Washington State. And uh, there's been a lot of interest lately in teleworking. So she's going to talk a little bit about how, how her office um, has implemented that, some of the challenges they face, and, and how they've overcome it. Am I going to need the microphone, or can you hear me in the back? Yeah, I
So while he's bringing that up, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Ronnie Sue Johnson, as she said, and I am the statewide administrator for our public assistance customer service contact center. So we do work that's a little bit um, different than many of you do in that we are doing intensive interviews for eligibility programs over the telephone. So our service handle times and those kinds of things, our metrics are a little bit different. It is perfectly normal and acceptable for us to have a call that takes 45 minutes. Um, that creates some interesting challenges, right? Uh, so I, I want to give you that as a little bit of background. I'm going to give you some background into what we do so that you can understand the context of how teleworking applies in that kind of world. But I think there are things that carry over for the, the kind of services that we're doing in teleworking and the kind of services that 311 or 211 or other call centers provide. So uh, we've got that. So I just pushed this button in the middle. Right? No, the one on the right or the one on the left? On the right, you have one on the left. So Washington State um, is, uh, our contact center is in our public assistance services are state-based. We're not county or local municipality-based for providing those services. And our contact center is a virtual contact center. Department of Social and Health Services is our umbrella social service agency. It's a gigantic agency. It's the largest one in the state. We have eight administrations that range from labor and industries to child welfare, um, you know, licensing, all those things that are agencies, and each agency is based with administrations. Department of Social and Health Services is the largest agency in the state, has eight separate administrations. Our services fall under the Economic Services Administration, which has two divisions. Community Services is one of those divisions. The Community Services Division has about 2,600, 2,800 employees in that division. So roll that up, our department, if we got to the Social Service Department is like 8,000 employees or something like that. It's gigantic. Um, our, our contact center is a virtual contact center. We have staff located in every part of the state just about. Uh, and we are physically located in the brick and mortar offices for the walk-in services. So though our contact center staff sit in a brick and mortar building where walk-in services are available, they don't report to the local administrator over those services. They report to uh, us virtually. We have 850 staff in our contact center, about, well, around 900. You always hire a few more because you're always going to have some that are on leave without pay and those kinds of things. So we have about 850 FTEs. They're located in 45 traditional brick and mortar offices across the state. And 170, approximately 170 of our staff telework from home. Why would you consider a telework program? When you're big and you're spread out already, why would you even uh, look at telework? Now I'm going to start looking at those. We, uh, we needed some room for growth. And one of the things that teleworking can give you is it can give you growth in your brick and mortar spaces because you can use the spaces that people who are no longer working there but are still working for you to fill them up. We started uh, two years ago, in particular, this became an issue for us. We needed to grow by 100 staff, but because we're in existing facilities, and there's no money in Washington State to build new facilities, it's one of the challenges, you know, we all have challenges we bang our head against the wall about. Mine is trying to get a facility where I can consolidate some staff instead of having them spread all over. There's, there's no current um, funding for building new facilities, so the only way you grow is to create space where you are and we needed room for growth, uh, so <coughs> we needed to um, increase our telepathy. It also is helpful with disaster recovery or just um, weather events. Now, Washington has a reputation of being like super rainy, it rains all the time, and this is true, we get our precipitation mostly in rain, and, and I grew up in Montana. So let me say, I, I'm adopted into Washington State, and I love my state with great affection, but every time it snows there, People lose their minds. <laughs> we had an event two years ago that they affectionately labeled Snow Again, and no one could go anywhere, and the snow was like a 50. <laughs> and some of you know more about snow than you know Western Washingtonians do. And everything shuts down in Seattle, in Olympia, our capital, in Tacoma. When it snows, 
everything shuts down. No one comes to work. So having teleworkers who are sitting at home and still able to work is very, very helpful to keep your telecenter operating because people are still calling because they are also not going into the brick and mortar buildings because no one goes anywhere when it snows. They're calling instead. So teleworking is a place for us um, to take advantage of dealing with weather events and also disaster recovery. If something happens on one side of the state uh, that affects a local area and you've got people a little bit outside that area telecommuting, you can bring things back up more quickly. It, for us, is also our most powerful staff retention tool. This is important for us because our public assistance eligibility programs are very complicated. We have both state and federal programs. It takes a long time to learn our average training from the time somebody comes in the door until they're considered proficient is 18 months, and they're in training for that period of time in classrooms for a minimum of about um, 15 weeks in the classroom and then OJT. That's a very expensive investment, mm -hmm. and we can't afford not to have retention. But like other telecenters, we had a pretty high turnover rate. We were running about a 30% turnover rate. When you've got that much upfront investment and they're leaving you two months before they end their 18 months, you have to find a way to keep them. And for us, um, teleworking was that. The other thing it is for us is a potential, it expands our recruitment pool. In some of our communities where it's hard to be competitive with wages, for example, in the city of Seattle, government jobs are not the best paying jobs. There are other jobs that pay better. But we, we can offer telecommuting, and if you live in the city of Seattle, that is an advantage because <coughs> it's really terrible. I'll talk about that in a minute. It also improves our ability to accommodate disability. So, for example, um, if they were working in our environment, in our, our brick and mortar facilities, as I shared, we're co located with our, with our walk in service facilities. We are dealing with people who are ill a lot. They come in for Medicaid services <coughs> because they need medical. Care. And they bring with them their contagious diseases and germs and exposure. It's almost as bad as working in a public school district. <laughs> <laughs> or a hospital. Um, and if you're somebody who has a disease where your immunity is compromised, you may not be able to work there anymore. And we have had that happen. Teleworking allows us to accommodate for that, where they can control that environment better, but they're a perfectly productive and, and good worker. They can be accommodated <coughs> in a different way than they could in facilities. And it's a staff morale issue. For, um, for the people, the ability to work at home just makes their day. They have a much nicer thing to look at out their window. Uh, many of our staff live in rural communities. And they can look out at the beautiful farmland outside their window, or the river, or the lake, rather than looking out the window at the parking garage next door. So. This is, this is one of the things that is really helpful for us staff morale. Our accommod the accommodation issue is not a small issue. I want to share that. 5% of our teleworkers, of 170%, are, are teleworking because they are on an accommodation. That's a pretty significant number for us when it comes to the numbers of staff that we're working. So our weather forecast in 2008, 2010, led us to really um, launch our teleworking program. We had several environmental factors that made teleworking something that we really wanted to pursue. One of those is that we were heading into the recession. Everybody was heading into the recession, right? And in Washington State, uh, that created issues for us. In public assistance, the irony of it is that your demand for your services goes up as the economy is crashing, but your funding to support your staffing goes down. Back to the retention conversation, we had to keep every single person we could keep. Because in our state, we were in a hiring freeze for almost three years. If someone left, we could not replace them. So we had to have a way to keep them. Uh, gas prices were escalating in our state with very high tax, um, both local taxes and state taxes on gas. There was periods of time where our gas um, was up to five dollars, almost five dollars a gallon. That makes it difficult for people to commute any distance. 
And so teleworking was like giving them a raise, which we also could not do because it'd be fun. So that was another factor. The Seattle traffic, for almost 100 miles, the I-5 corridor in Washington State is um, jam-packed every day of the week for half of the day during major commute times. It's the fourth worst traffic in the United States. If you've never driven through that area, you are fortunate. I drove from the airport here to downtown, and it took me less time to get from your airport to downtown than sometimes it takes to get across town in Seattle. It's crazy, crazy traffic there. So this was a factor for trying to um, keep people working for us in Seattle. Because if we could send them home, we could keep them off the road. In that area. Um, let's see. Talked about the hiring freeze, pace, load growth, yeah, and the economy. So, so things were kind of getting scary during this period of time. Our caseload, for example, in the SNAP benefits, our food stamp benefits, grew by, in a one year period of time, it grew by almost 100,000 people that we were serving with no additional resources to serve them. So these are some of the things that we were doing. We also, though, um, despite those challenges, had a very supportive environment for making telework work for us. We had an executive order um, from our governor that said we really want agencies to create telework and alternate work uh, week programs because we want to deal with traffic and, thing, and we want to make Washington government uh, an employer of choice. So we had an executive order that the agencies were all working in. We also have a vigorous commute trip reduction program in Washington State, again, because of the cost of gas and because of the traffic issues on what in western Washington. These are not true in eastern Washington. Very different dynamics on the west side of the state. And for the geography of Washington, here's, here's also a strange thing. When we talk about the west side of the state, politically and um, geographically, we are talking this little corner and the rest of it we don't consider the west side of the state. Like the mountain range runs here and everything else is east. This is the northwest corner, extremely rural over here. We're really talking this kind of corner here. So a lot of the issues that affect the western side of the state really only affect the urban areas uh, along the south. We already, in our contact center, were working in a virtual environment. As I said, our staff, we built up our contact center not by saying, we're going to make a statewide contact center, we're going to put it here. We said we're going to take existing staff who do the same work as our public assistant staff. We're going to take them, and instead of having them do it face-to-face, -face, we're going to do it by phone, and they're going to do it from the offices they already sit in. So we were already uh, connected virtually and working remotely. That experience was important because teleworking is virtual supervision and we already had some of that in place. We had folks who were supervising staff that were sitting in an office that was maybe as far as 60 miles away from where they sat. And they were their direct first line supervisor. So we had some experience already with how to do that. We also had dependable uh, supportive technology already in place. We use VPN. Are you all familiar with VPN? <laughs> So we use VPN uh, for connecting our teleworkers. We already had managers who were doing telework. Telework is very helpful for us in our management um, uh, pool, making our management pool bigger, because it's very difficult to recruit staff from the eastern side of the state, for example, who are very talented and wonderful people like my colleague, uh, Brett Fisher, who's with me today, to work in our headquarters office over on the Sound and, and have to cost of living issues and moving are difficult. But when we allow teleworking, they can come over for meetings when they need to and they can telework from where they live. And that increases our recruiting pool, which was also very helpful. We don't um, do that with our frontline staff, have them telework across state. But we can at least look at some of the folks who a commute would be unreasonable for them if they can We already had a central single phone number and we use the Avaya platform that was connecting people so that we could do teleworking from anywhere in the state and they could receive calls and do work for any caller anywhere in the state. We're not geographically based. If you live in any corner of this state, we call that same number and any staff person who's also located in any part of that state will receive that call and can do that work for you. 
So we didn't have to worry about, can they only telework in a specific geographic region to serve a specific geographic population? That was helpful for us. We also were experienced, because of that um, virtual um, system that we were already working in, we were experienced with using remote communication technologies. At the time, it was Microsoft Communicator. became a very important tool for us in keeping connected to our workers that weren't sitting in the building with us. And continues to be, it's now Link, it's going to be Skype for Business very shortly. Um, it, it is one of our single most important tools for keeping connected to our teleworkers, for application sharing when they're having problems with the case, and we can look into that case with them and work through with them. So having tools like that in place were important factors for making teleworking work for us with the work that we do. We had a lot of time to prep, and I know there are a couple others of you I heard yesterday who also have telework programs, and, and um, it takes a while to build it, doesn't it? I think I heard you say 18 months or something like that. Two, yeah, two, two years. years. Oh, that's about, about how long it, yeah, that's about how long it <laughs> took us to. We started planning um, at the administration level in 2008, 2009. We issued our telework handbook. I brought two copies of it only because I did want to cut down half the trees uh, in Washington State. It's a 40-page <coughs> telework handbook. I brought uh, copies. If you want to take a hard copy, you can. We're also going to be including a copy of this with our presentation that's going to go out on the website, so you can all access that if you want to, in addition to some forms and things. We have lots of forms attached to this program. But it was important for us to codify what our program was going um, to look like. So we have our handbook that we developed, and it was issued in 2009 for the administration. And then we had to decide how will we in our division implement this, and our contact center was selected to do a, a pilot with this. We had to include labor in that conversation. We are a collective bargaining state, and so anytime we're going to do something that impacts potentially working conditions, we need to negotiate that, which we did. We negotiated with labor around what the impacts of how this would work would be. And one of the first key decisions we had to make before we were ready for that decision is what's going to be our eligibility criteria. That's something important to think about if you're looking at um, telework program and you're in a merit system or a labor system so that you can have consistency about who does and who does not get to telework. And how many could we support? Is it 50% of our staff? Is it 20% of our staff? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we needed to consider is if uh, we decided it was going to be merit based. You had to earn the right to telework, so you had to be a, a person who was performing well. When you do that, you have to decide how many of those highly performing people can you afford to have out of the office, because who's left in the office, if all of your high performers go out, who's left in the office with your trainees? Who are the <coughs> people they're exposed to that are mentoring them? Is your people who are not your highest performers? Maybe not the people you want most bringing your new trainees along culturally. So we had to think about what would our ratio be and what would our um, level be. Our collective bargaining, the factors that were concerned for, of concern for our um, union was what kind of, what scope of work would the staff do? Are they going to get to do better, more cool kind of work? Are they going to have to do the grunt work? Are they going to get to do the full scope of work so they keep their skills current? Those are, those are issues that we're concerned for our labor. Also, the selection criteria and what will be the selection process. They care a lot about that, as did we. Um, so we worked on that together. And what would be the process for change to our telework agreements? Our teleworking um, arrangements are formalized. They have to have a teleworking agreement that they sign, their supervisor signs, their administrator signs, and ultimately, as the appointing authority, I approve Based on recommendation of my managers, let me show you I don't individually know each of these employees. So, so we have a very formal process, which meant that if we decided that we're going to pull them back out of telework, we need to have the flexibility on the management side to do it when we need to and not have to renegotiate that, but then also to have something that's fair for the employees. If they've been allowed to telework, can we just can a supervisor just randomly say, I don't like you today, you're done teleworking. No, we needed to have a criteria for what does it mean to come back in and no longer be teleworking? 
So we bargained all of those and set those up in our policies and procedures to make sure that we had it really well documented what that policy and procedure would look like. And then we had to coordinate deployment. One of the things that we um, learned along the way, I'll, I'll talk about some other lessons learned, but one of the things we learned is that it matters if these people are technologically savvy. If you send someone home who is a uh, help desk frequent flyer, your <laughs> IT people <laughs> 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 They will not be pleased with your program if you send people home who cannot do some basic troubleshooting on their own. So we included IT in the selection process and uh, made sure that they got to have a little bit of say and give us some feedback in case we didn't know that this person was a frequent flyer, that they were or they weren't able to do some basic troubleshooting on their own. If something goes down, they have to be able to basically troubleshoot over the phone with IT at home by themselves. We did our first rollout in early 2011 of our first group of staff, and we uh, did it annually. Uh, once a year, we did a cycle, an application cycle from 2012 to 2014, and we're now doing two cycles a year because our goal is to keep 20% of our staff teleworking, and as people promote or they select other positions, we end up with less than 20% of our people teleworking. Mm -hmm. So every year we're trying to refresh that pool of people who completed training and are ready to go out to telework. Teleworking in our contact center today, we're not a pilot. We had to formally say we're not a pilot uh, anymore because people would say, how is the pilot going? The pilot is no longer pilot. It's business as usual. We incorporate how we do teleworking into our business plan um, for our strategic planning processes. We use it in our facility strategic planning um, guidelines. The facility planners for the state were very excited to hear about teleworking. They wanted us to be doing 15% teleworking or more, and so at times, one of the things we had to guard against was their assumption that that's what we were gonna do, and they were planning around shrinking our space for us. <laughs> no, thank you. We're trying to hold that growth space. We're doing this for growth, not so that you can reduce our leases, right? But they were very excited with the thought that we could reduce our leases. So um, we have to make sure that we've got this incorporated in our business plan and we've talked with all the stakeholder people who control budgeting and that kind of stuff so they understand what we're doing with this system. Our teleworking handbook, if you take a look at it, talks about teleworking from an alternate office than their home office. But our teleworking in the contact center is, is from home, not from other locations because we're already remote around the state. It doesn't make sense to do it just office to office. Uh, so we have 20% of our agents full-time. They do it full-time, not, not some days or others. They do it full-time. They, We do, however, because it's not, it's a privilege, not a right, we maintain their official duty station at a facility, at an office facility. Teleworking is their alternate site. Their official duty station is at the facility. That's important to us because we don't pay travel expenses to commute to the office from home. If their home was their official duty station, we would have to pay travel to come to the office, mileage, etc. We don't do that. The office is their official duty station. They travel on their own costs if they need to come into the office. We also do require that they come into the office for staff meetings, that they come into the office for training, and monthly they meet with their supervisor in an in-person meeting so they can talk about how they're doing their progress, their performance metrics, those kinds of things. Um, so they're required to come in and do that. In our first early stages, we didn't always have that in place and that was something that we learned we needed to be doing with our events. The agency provides their computers, which they get to take home. So inventory is a process they must participate in with us. Also, our system is a little wonky. Our IT system is a little wonky. Does anybody in here have a perfect IT system? I'd really love to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We don't have a perfect IT system because we've made it so complicated that our IT is a more challenge just to keep us functional all the time. Band-aids, spit, and go. Um, so so uh, our teleworkers have to bring their computers in every month to have them patched and updated. and. We have not yet got to the place where they can that can be done effectively remotely, so we use their once a month meeting with their supervisor to also bring in your computer, let's get it patched. Uh, 
But if something big happens, like some huge virus thing goes out there and they have to do massive patching around virus protection, then we have to stagger and bring people in for special patching. Our goal in the next couple of years is to be using virtual desktops where they're not actually bringing an actual computer into the office, but they're directly connected to the server. We aren't there yet. Um, we have our annual planning cycle where we go through the application process twice a year now. People apply, it's a very rigorous application process. They have to meet performance expectations. Their direct supervisor and their uh, geographic administrator have to agree that they and IT have to agree that their performance warrants uh, their ability to be able to telework. And underperformers, for those that are not maintaining their performance level to stay in, we give them a 60-day review period to bring their performance back up to standard. If they don't uh, meet that performance expectation in 60 days, we may return them to the office so that they can have more direct support and coaching in order to maintain their performance or get it back up doesn't mean they won't be eligible to go back out in some future date, but we bring them back in. We don't want somebody sitting out there and languishing at home, not doing well, and just letting that continue. And then we focus on success. We have uh, specific formal supports for teleworkers in place, including a six-month review where the supervisor and the teleworker talk about, is this really working for you? There are some people who are don't enjoy teleworking. They think they're going to, and then they don't. We have to have an option and a way for them to return to the office. So we also have some structures around how long do we keep their workspace, their cubicle, dedicated in case they need to come back. We don't give it away. And uh, we have a five to one ratio for our workspaces. Five teleworkers share one work cubicle once they're currently out. And that that's been difficult to maintain because if we have to bring them more than one back in, you now we've got an issue, but we're uh, trying really hard to hold on to that. We've also been providing more supervisor support um, for teleworking. Oh, you're good. Okay. So this is a little productivity snapshot. The reason I wanted to give you the background of the kind of work we do is because you might look at the, this data and go, well, geez, they're taking four calls an hour. That is not <laughs> a good thing. But in our eligibility interviews for renewals, those interviews can take 25 to 30 minutes sometimes. Um, and so taking four, our non-telework staff, um, which are granted not our highest performers and often our trainees, but still, uh, even those that are that just chose not to telework. Our non-telework staff average about 4.1 calls an hour working through those processes in that kind of an interview, our teleworkers get 5.2, which is, over time, a significant bump in productivity. Um, and, and that kind of trend holds true for all of our processing cues, where they're actually processing casework and working with the client around their individual cases. The interesting thing is our triage queue is the opposite. Our in-office workers, do more calls per hour than our home workers. Now the reason for that is because our <coughs> staff rotate through each of these queues. These are not specialized workers. So the same staff person that can take an extremely complex case and work it through it in one month working on new eligibility interviews, for example, is going to be doing triage next month. And they're journey level workers. They're going to take more time when they get that triage call to look at the case and find out what does this client really need before they hand them off. And they sneak work out of, out of the scope of that queue. They're like, I can do this change of address really quick. They're not supposed to do that on that queue, but because they are able to do so, sometimes they just do. And so our, our more experienced workers, they do that more often than our newbies who are like, oh yes, I can transfer your call. They just move them right along. But our experienced workers are like, let me just get this out of the way. I'll just do this, just this once. And they do just this once several times a day. <laughs> so, um, so they do fewer calls on our triage line. They're still, if we have a range of calls that are acceptable, they're still working within that acceptable range. They do lots more interviews. So uh, we just know this about them and we kind of give them some room to do that as long as their customer service overall isn't backing up the queues. Back office production is when people send in paperwork. 
We have electronic case records in our state, not, not paper case records. So all of those documents go into a single statewide pool. Anyone from the state who have uh, of these type of worker can work that work, whether they're a lobby worker or they're a call center worker. We call that back office work. Someone sends it a change, they send in a verification for their application, for example. Our teleworking staff also process more of that kind of work through the course of their day in between calls or um, when they're assigned to do that specifically than our non-telework staff do. They stay focused and they stay highly productive. One, because they're motivated to do so, they have to in order to retain their ability to telework. If they're not performing, they come back. So it's important for them to maintain that. And two, they don't have some of the distractions that happen in our workplaces, which is the coworker who stops by and says, can I ask you a question really quick and it took 15 minutes? They don't have that. They don't get that as much. So this is only one uh, example of the metrics that we use for staff, but it's one of the ones that we use to document to people who, in our state, teleworking for workers like ours was really new and they were, it was strange and they wanted to know, does it really work? How do you know they're really working? How do you know they're really working when you can't look at them? We have a lot of monitoring tools, but performance is one of those areas. Lessons learned. Communication counts, both in the process and um, keeping communication with the teleworker while they're working. We had to describe our process to many people to support it. It was a new and weird idea. We deal with confidential information. How to sell our, our stakeholders and our leadership that it was okay for people who are working with really confidential information to do that in their homes. We had to communicate a lot. Communicating how we were going to monitor that, how we were going to manage the system was important. We needed good um, monitoring tools to be in place in order to know that staff were doing what they were supposed to be doing and to support them in that. And supervisors need to know how to use those tools really well because they can't manage those staff by walking around and seeing what they're doing and hearing their phone call. They had to become really proficient at those electronic monitoring tools. Uh, the selection process counts. The first, when we were piloting, we first rolled it out, it was a little bit loose for us, and we had some folks out in telework we should not have had out in telework. We learned the lesson the hard way that our selection process needs to be tight and consistent, because we're statewide. Staff over here need to be confident that the criteria for them getting approved is the same as the staff person over here. We have to be very consistent with that. In our environment, so it um, it matters how you set up your selection criteria. In ours, um, as I said, they have to have above average performance. They can't be they can't be just kind of average workers. They have to be our top level workers. They have to have very good attendance and self discipline, and they have to have that reasonable technical ability to do basic troubleshooting. Remote supervision can be difficult. Not every teleworker is, and not every person is suited to telework, but not every supervisor is suited to supervise teleworkers either. Folks who do best in person with people and aren't, like if it's, some, if it's a supervisor, heaven forbid, in a call center who doesn't like to talk on the phone, you have a problem. Because, because they're only going to communicate with their staff through email, instant messaging, and telephone most of the time. And if they don't, if they aren't very technologically savvy, they're going to have a hard time supervising people who have to be remotely working. So that piece matters. Um, the other thing that for supervisors we needed to do is make sure that they had training and all of the tools that they needed for monitoring and accountability that they were actually doing it. So their administrators need to be sure that the supervisors are doing what they're supposed to do around their teleworkers and that they know what their teleworkers are doing and how they're doing in their performance. We had to, we learned a lesson around staff and supervisor ratio. In our first early years of teleworking, we said anyone can telework including our lead workers and our supervisors. I, um, I came into my job just about two and a half years ago and I came into one team that served a statewide caseload that had only one supervisor physically in the office, but they had only 10% of their staff out on telework, which meant that all the other staff that they had in their offices did not have a supervisor present. Their supervisor was sitting at home, working from home. Some people can supervise remotely really well and that work work out for them, but in some cases what would happen is the lead worker became the de facto supervisor. And those in-the-moment learning moments for trainees were getting missed. Um, 
interpersonal issues where you need a supervisor intervention quickly to keep it from becoming a problem were becoming the responsibility of somebody else in the office. So we had to undo some of that and be really careful about what was our ratio of supervisors and lead workers that were teleworking and how would they do that? How would they keep their supervisor responsibilities even though they were teleworking? One of the things that has worked successfully for us that we're moving more towards into the future is if an entire team is teleworking, the supervisor and the lead worker can also be teleworkers. And that works well because uh, a supervisor who has both teleworkers and in-office people tends to have the uh, tyranny of the urgent take them over and the staff person that's in their face is the one that gets their attention and the teleworker starts to get kind of left out of the loop. So having an entire team that teleworks, that teleworking supervisor is connecting with their teleworkers all the time and working on team dynamic as a teleworking team versus a mixed team. So we're moving in that direction, we're not quite there yet. It is not all sunshine and rainbows. If you have rainbows, you have a cloud somewhere. And you found some of them. Right? Rainbows only come with rain. So um, if you're approving supervisors and lead staff, be careful of the balance of how many of those and where you have those do that. Make sure you invest the time in your supervisors to um, help them know how to supervise remotely. It is a different, it's a little bit of a different skill set, particularly if they're supervisors who grew up in the system that started in a face-to-face -face context. They'll need some help. And then accountability. Teleworker engagement was another issue. Those that have been out teleworking longest for us, two, three, four years, it's very easy for them to get disconnected from the culture, disconnected from the dynamic of what's happening in the organization. We are an organization that runs by work group. All of our process improvement occurs by work group. If all of our best best workers are out teleworking and they don't want to come in for work group engagement, we don't get to pick their brain. We don't get their knowledge and their insight. So we had to be very intentional, and we didn't do this at first, and we're coming back around to it now, about engaging them in those kinds of things that happen in the office culture. If we're having a potluck, we're going to tie it to a staff meeting, and you've got to come in. You don't get to just say, I'm not coming. You don't get to say, I'm not going to come and participate in um, a safety committee at the local office. We need some of our teleworkers engaged in the safety committee. We have a very rigorous safety program that includes for our teleworkers things like if you get a, if you get a bomb threat, how does a teleworker deal with a bomb threat that's in another office? How do you communicate about that? What is your plan for how teleworkers deal with that? And how do, how do they notify somebody if they've got a suicide call on the line? Which is not in our scope of work, but happens all the time, and you probably get some of those in your call centers too, right? Um, the ladies that you know by name that we talked about yesterday. How do, you, how do you help a teleworker know how to get somebody's attention around that? And so be, be more formal and um, thoughtful about how you set those up. Once they get really good at teleworking, sometimes they don't want to come back in. We require it. It's not optional. You have to come into the office. Um, interestingly enough, those of our uh, teleworkers who live farthest away from an office, they like to come in and connect with their coworkers. The ones who live in town two blocks from the office, we, it's like pulling teeth to get them to come in. I do not know. You could walk. What is the issue? Uh, they don't want to come in. So we, we make them, we make them because in, we want to keep them engaged. The lesson learned there is uh, to set that expectation when they first start to telework, not after they've been doing it for a while. And build into the telework plan with them how they're going to stay engaged with the rest of the office. So that was a lesson. And then unexpected consequences plan for unexpected consequences, uh, or you can't plan because they're unexpected, but be prepared for that. Our unexpected consequence that we're dealing with, um, our retention rate in our teleworking is, is really great. We have about a 2% turnover rate in our teleworking staff as compared to what we were experiencing 30% in our main contact center. Really great retention. Um, very small number of them have returned to the office because they decided they didn't like it. Most of our turnover in our teleworkers is because they promote 
but herein lies our unintended consequence. Our best workers went out on telework, and the promotional range from uh, our line person to our lead to our supervisor is pretty small. So we have a hard time encouraging them to promote into our supervisory positions, and they are exactly the people we want to have as supervisors. So our pool of people who are applying for our supervisory positions has shrunk because our teleworking program is so successful. They don't want to come in. They don't want to come, they don't want to, now they're going to get a tiny little raise, but they're going to have to pay to commute again. And they're going to have the headache of dealing with human beings as employees. Um, and so some of them are like, why would I give up my home telework for that? They're not offering me enough. And we, we have, um, you know, we're not private sector. We can't say we'll give you a bigger raise. I'm in. We're bound by our um, collective bargaining. So we're working on how to, again, if they're going out early on and talk about, think about what promotion might look like for you and how do you stay engaged that, how do you stay connected to that and plant that seed for them when they first go out. Because we've had positions where we've posted for supervisory positions in the city of Seattle, for example, where it's difficult to commute and get around, where we have tried three or four times to fill supervisory positions and could not and just had to leave them unfilled because our teleworkers would not come in and no one else is going to move there to take those jobs. So think about um, what you'll do when you get uh, some unintended consequence and how you'll deal with that because you will have some kind of unintended consequence. So, um, that's our experience, and uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to share them. Yes. Um, how do you deal with this is something I've heard from my HR department, Human Resources? Um, they're concerned about workman's comp issues, somebody tripping on something at home. Um, you know, so how do, how do you deal with that? We have not. Um, is this real wood? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, five years into it, we have not had any workman's comp issues claimed for tripping hazards or I fell down or any of those kinds of things. We have had repetitive motion claims because they're typing all day long. And one of the things that's in our handbook is how to set up your workstation in an ergonomic way. And they're certifying that they have an office space set up that does that, that meets that requirement. Um, and we provide, if they need an ergo keyboard, for example, we provide that. But we don't provide their furniture. They're responsible for that themselves. And their official duty station, if they need special equipment, we do offer that, but not at home. Do you do any in-home inspections of their, like, surprise visits by supervisors or something to see if it's We retain safe. that right, but we have not yet ever done it. Um, one of the things that... This gets back to the supervisor training, though. It is really important that the supervisors are clued into what's really going on, with it, and they're, they're connected and, and know their teleworkers really well. Because there are some situations where it's going to be the supervisor that notices something's wrong. We had a circumstance, for example, where a teleworker who used to be very engaged when she worked in the office um, started calling in sick or not calling in, um, we can monitor at the time of day when they log into the system. Uh, if they are going to be away, they have to put in a leave request just like anybody else. They can't just walk away from their desk and not take leave. She would log in and she started logging in like an hour, hour and a half late and not calling in and this was unusual behavior for her. And one day she just didn't call in at all. Because she had worked in the office first, we require everyone to work in the office first. They don't get hired and go straight to teleworking. They have to be kind of acculturated uh, with us before. So knowing that this wasn't normal behavior for her and knowing where she lived, they did go do a site visit. And they found that our worker had become, um, was beginning to struggle with agoraphobia and was basically melting down at home, lived alone, was no longer engaged socially with the staff because they were working from home. And they were in a very dangerous uh, state of mind. But because the supervisor was 
clued into this person as a person. And this is, again, why who supervises teleworkers matters. They were able to get her the help that she needed. Ultimately, we brought her back into the office so that we could help her um, get socially stable again and work with her physician around that. So in this case, the accommodation was actually not to telework instead of to telework because that was necessary. But uh, supervisors need to be having those kind of conversations all the time with their teleworkers so they know what's going on with them. And if it's labor and industries type kind of concern that the worker's having, they can nip it in the bud early before, uh, before it becomes a labor and industries problem. Just gonna make two comments because it kind of came up. The first thing we do is we do quarterly site visits. Um, we do go out to the, to the home. Um, and then also when we do our status meetings, we do them on the phone with the, with the agent. So we, <clears throat> we are connecting that way all the time. And we do inspections for the space before we allow them to, to work from home. Um, we supply all the equipment, the telephone, the computers, the desk, everything. Oh, so you do the desk. So we do it a little bit differently. Yeah. What about the internet access? Do you pay for that? We do not. So um, in our system, they are required to have a landline which is unusual uh, for people, but, but because of our patchwork of systems, they have to have a landline and they have to have high-speed internet. And there are some folks who have applied for and have been approved for telework and then they learn in their community they only have satellite internet and it doesn't really work with our phone system. So they don't have the option then of teleworking because the infrastructure won't support that for them at their home. But they have to provide that on their own. Um, we have some parameters around what happens if the system goes down, if their system goes down. They have an hour of work time in which to determine that they can't get it fixed and brought back up, and then they got to come to the office or take leave so that they can't just say, my system was down, and then be able to not work. Have you ever had anybody not return the equipment? No, we haven't. Um, we have recently, just recently, had somebody who was having a medical condition and was hospitalized, and so we were having to work with the family to retrieve the equipment, but, um, but we haven't had that be a significant issue for us. This is part of why we're so careful about who we select for follower, and why if they are starting to slide in performance or in any aspect of performance, we deal with that really early on um, so that we can get them back in while they're still engaged with us and we don't have anybody fully disengaging while they're out there. Under reasonable accommodation, it does, the one exception to the having to already be a high performer is around sometimes accommodation because sometimes the home accommodation is we'll get them back performing where they need to be. We will do that for a trial period and then if it doesn't meet the accommodation need to be able to bring them back up to performing to expectation, then we bring them back in the office and end that accommodation. So that's the one exception to having folks telework who are not yet performing at our regular expectation standard. This might only be an issue in the beginning, but do you find ongoing conversations going on in your brick and mortar contact center of I've been waiting to be a teleworker, but it's not opening yet, or is there like negative morale in the contact centers with people that want to go off to it, but they don't have that opportunity. There was, for, ratios. Yeah, there was for a little while. Um, I, I had a reputation as being somebody who didn't like telework, so I find it a little ironic that I'm here talking to you about telework, because when I first came into my position, I put a moratorium on any further telework, in part because of that issue I talked about with our facilities planners, deciding that half of our staff could telework and they were starting to snack up. They were, they were taking up space. And I said, Whoa, we're not putting anybody else out because I need feet on the ground to claim the space. <laughs> I need bodies in the seat to claim the space. Um, and for that period of time, they were like, when are we going to get to do the thing? Um, we actually, surprisingly, the last few times, we had more openings, more available, more capacity than we had people applying. In part because we'd gone through this hiring freeze for so long when we came out of it. We had such a large number of staff who were still new, they didn't meet the criteria yet. 
So those are the folks that are most anxious to telework now, is the ones who are still in training and they're just trying to make the bit to get through training, to get through being, you know, deemed uh, performing well enough to go out and then they do it. We have had some interesting things. People will say, okay, I want to move. So I want to start teleworking now so I can move, and then they want to be uh, out of state. We've had some people say, I want to move to Oregon, to the south side of Portland. I'll be five hours away from the closest physical office, but that's okay, let me telework. No, no. We have some criteria around how far you can telework from. You also can't live up at the top of Mount Rainier. <laughs> so uh, you do have to give them a little bit of um, guidance around how, you have to think about how far away from an office can they be to allow for teleworking. And we have had people who try to use the accommodation process, once you open the door to accommodation for telework in a place that's uh, traditionally brick and mortar, then some people will try to use that for their advantage in negative ways as well. And so we have had people um, paint themselves into an accommodation corner, I would say, where they would um, come to us with medical that said, the only thing that will work for me is to let me work from home. <laughs> and we know that's not a good fit. And so we work closely with our HR department around those kind of issues to say, really, is that true? And why would that be? And how else can we accommodate? Because we don't want the, we don't want people being able to telework from home to run away from a performance accountability issue, which is sometimes what happens. They they would like to be able to do that sometimes. Yes. How close are you to virtualization uh, of the PCs? That 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 would really take care of a lot of your equipment issues and everything from home. It surely would, and. Um, this is a secret. I haven't even told my staff, so don't call tell on anybody. Brett, Brett, you're sworn to secrecy. <laughs> I, uh, I'm in conversation with Brett's boss um, about can we start rolling that out in the next in this fiscal year, which started which starts July for us, our next fiscal year. Um, can we start rolling that out so that we can get all of our teleworkers on the virtual desktop, where they will have a keyboard, their monitors, and then they'll be directly connected to. Server. We have to potentially purchase a new server and make that happen. Have room on the server for that direct connection. Right now, we're going through a via one X, and that because of the 45 different local telephone systems that we're running that across, our system's fairly unstable. With every every week, sometimes every day, we have some portion of our system where calls aren't coming through and it's not working very well. So. Um, we think the direct connect is going to the direct connection is going to help us with the stability factor. Hopefully, in this next fiscal year. We have um, we have two employees that telework the whole time, um, and our reasoning was City Hall we work in City Hall, and it closes at 5 p.m. But our shift, we have two people that have to work until six um, for our service center. And so we kind of put it up as a volunteer. And so we had two people volunteer. We had a high performer and a low performer volunteer. And we actually found that the low performer performs better yes. and working in their home environment. We've seen a market increase in their success with their metrics. So for a low performer, it ended up working out great for us. And that's a really good point. Sometimes it can help performance, um, especially if it's an incentive to bring that performance up to get to keep to do that. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I sometimes have is I'll have supervisors that say, you know, my, my team would just run so much better if we could send that person home. That was part of the improvement. Yeah. <laughs> because, because sometimes you have people whose metrics are pretty good, but they are not fun to be around. Mm -hmm. you ever do that? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we're the only people that have all over the office, or, or they're really great with clients, but they hate all of their coworkers. You know, they're cranky with the coworkers. You know, if we send them home, that'd be so much better. Um, and occasionally, in those cases, you actually see everybody's production come up when that person finally decides, I need to start teleworking. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where we are with time, but 
I will be around. I have, um, like I said, a couple of copies of our handbook, and then I have my business cards if you had any questions that you wanted to follow up with or wanted any copies of anything that we've produced in Washington State, if you have to send them.